I saw Dr. Sanders yesterday at the Bible Training School, and uh, he told me that he would not be here. Uh, but a number of years ago, Dr. Sanders wrote an article about the Los Angeles Bible Training School. And in that article, one of the things that he said is that LABTS is the best Bible Institute in Los Angeles. And so that's quite a compliment coming from Dr. Sanders. Another thing that he said is that LABTS is probably one of the best kept secrets in Los Angeles area. I'm not here to promote LABTS. I want to tell you about a school that is far greater than the school that I serve at. In fact, this school that outstrips and outshines LABTS in every way. It's a school that offers no degrees at all. The only way that you can get into this school is not by taking comprehensive exams. It's very easy, so to speak, to get in. You have to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you will never graduate from this school. You, you, you will never get to the point here on earth where you can say, I've completed this school and that I've graduated from this school. I want to introduce you to this school. You might be familiar with it. You might not be that familiar with it. But if you turn in your Bible to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, you will learn about this amazing, marvelous school. Titus chapter 2, beginning at verse 11, where the Apostle Paul is writing to his spiritual son in a common faith, Titus. And in Titus chapter 2 at verse 11, Paul writes, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The best school in all the world is the school of God's grace. The school of God's grace is far better than the school that you're in right now. It's far better than any school that you could ever imagine. The school of God's grace. And that's what Paul writes about, particularly in verses 12 through 14. In Titus chapter 2, Paul is concerned with telling Titus to speak the things which fit sound doctrine. Having good theology, good beliefs is not enough. Paul says, Titus, you must speak. You must teach. You have a responsibility to say those things that fit, that harmonize with sound doctrine. And so in Titus chapter 2, verses 2, all the way to verse 10, Paul talks about godliness and what godliness looks like for older men and for older women and young women and young men and even slaves. And having told Titus what he is to communicate to the people of God on the island of Crete, Paul lets Titus know that at the foundation at the basis of godly living is good theology. And typically when you look at the writings of Paul, sometimes he will start off talking about who we are in Christ. He'll start off with good theology. Then he says, on this basis, live. He does that in the book of Ephesians. But here in Titus 2, he begins with how we're to live. But he always wants us to understand as Christians that the foundation of godly living is good theology. The foundation of proper belief, uh, pro proper behavior is proper belief. 
And so Paul introduces to Titus, so to speak, this idea of the grace of God. And he makes an amazing statement. He says that God's grace appeared. It burst on the scene. It manifested itself. There was an epiphany, so to speak, when it comes to God's grace. And what he's referring to is that time in history when the eternal Son of God was conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. And he was born, and he lived a life, a perfect life, and he died on the cross, and he was buried, and he was resurrected, and he ascended back to heaven. Paul says when you look at the life of Christ, when you look at his person and his work, that is the appearance of the grace of God. God's marvelous grace toward you and toward me is manifested and was manifested in Christ coming into this world. But I don't want to focus on the appearance of God's grace. I want to focus in on what Paul says in verse 12 when he says concerning this grace that it instructs us. Here is Paul writing to Titus. And he's saying, Titus, the grace of God that has appeared instructs us. It teaches us. It educates us. It schools us. It trains us. Titus, the grace of God teaches you. And Titus, the grace of God teaches me. And it teaches the people of God. And that's the focus from verse 12 all the way to verse 14. And so when it comes to living a godly life, when it comes to the school of God's grace, God helps us to live a life that pleases him by enrolling us automatically in this school. When you're saved, you are enrolled in the school of God's grace. And in that school, there are three courses that we take from the day we're in that school to the day that we die. We are enrolled in three courses. And the courses that we take simultaneously. The first course focuses in on our past life. The second course focuses in on our present life. And the third course focuses on the future life. And I want us to look at these three courses because this is what God's grace is continually, repeatedly teaching the child of God. I want us to see the course that focuses in on the past life. That is, that life that we lived before we put our trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That pre-salvation life. As we live today, as we live day in and day out, we must keep in mind what our relationship is to be to the past life. And so Paul says in verse 12 that the grace of God instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. You see, the school of God's grace, the purpose of it is that we might live in the present age. That's the goal of the school of God's grace. That's the aim. That's the passion, that we might live. The, the Christian life is not an idle life. The Christian life is not a shallow life. It's a life where we live. And Paul is saying, why, while we're living, we need to make sure that we have a proper relation to our old life. And when it comes to the old life, he says that it's our responsibility that God's grace is teaching us to deny that old life, to renounce that old life, to reject how we used to live before we got saved. God's grace operates in your life and my life and is continually instructing us and teaching us that when it comes to the old way of living, 
when it comes to who we were outside of Jesus Christ, that we reject that. We deny ungodliness in worldly desires. And I know sometimes as Christians, we forget what we used to be. Some of us have been Christians for quite a while. And we've forgotten sometimes what we used to be. But in case you've forgotten, you need to let your eyes fall on Titus chapter 3, verse 3. Because Paul talks about what we used to be. And not just what we used to be, but what he used to be. And what Titus used to be. Before God stepped in and saved us. Paul says in, in verse 3 of Titus 3, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various desires and pleasures. We, we spent our life in malice and envy. We were hateful in hating one another. That's all of us before we got saved. We might not have given evidence of that fully and totally, but the seeds were in each and every one of us before God saved us. We were deceived, we were disobedient, we were enslaved, we spent our life in malice and in envy, we were hateful and hating one another. And Paul says when it comes to that way of life, when it comes to what we used to be, we must say no to that. We must deny ungodliness in what he calls here worldly desires. And Satan is going to come to us and tempt us consistently and regularly to fall back into the old life to fall back into the old way of living. When you and I are solicited to sin, we're solicited to be all that we used to be before we got saved. And Paul mentions that in our text when he says that we have to say no to what? Ungodliness. To anything that's against God. To anything that leaves God out. To anything that's contrary to God, we must say no to that. We must deny that. And not only that, he says also, we must say no to worldly desires, to desires that are characteristic of the world. That is that system that is headed by Satan, that is made up of unbelievers and has values and beliefs that leave God out. Those desires that are worldly, we must say no to. The grace of God is at work in your life and my life, teaching us, instructing us to say no to ungodliness in worldly desires. That's one of the classes that we are in. A class that focuses in on our past life. But there's more to Christian living than just saying no to sin. There's also a class that focuses in on the present life. Paul goes on to say in verse 12 that the grace of God instructs us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. God's grace is always at work in us. It's always teaching us. It's always schooling us and educating us to embrace the present life, to embrace a life where we're living in such a way that pleases God, that we're living in a manner that reflects that we have some godly sense. That's what he means by sensibly. I'm not sure that's a part of our vocabulary as Christians. But if you study the book of Titus, one of the words that keeps popping up is this word sensible, sensibly. 
It's really a key word that Paul uses in this book that speaks of a mind that is controlled, a mind that is curbed from sinful desires, a mind that is set on God. And so even in Titus chapter 1, when Paul talks about elders, he says elders must be men who are sensible. And then when he talks about what the older men and the older women, etc., are to be, he keeps telling them over and over again, older men, they're to be temperate in verse 2. They're to be dignified. They're to be sensible. And he doesn't say that directly to the older women, but he assumes that because he says older women have the responsibility to train younger women to be pure and sensible. You can't train somebody to be something that you're not. And in fact, when Paul says that the older women are to motivate the younger women, it really is this word sensible. And when it comes to young men, if you're a young man, and most of you look like young men except some who are sitting on the front row, but most of you are young men. But, but it's interesting when Paul talks about what young men are to be, what, what their lifestyle is to be that fits sound doctrine, he doesn't come up with a long list. He comes up with one word. He says, Titus, urge young men to be, and there's that word, sensible. Everything that a young man is to be is wrapped up in that word sensible. One who has sound mind. One who has a controlled mind. One who has a devoted mind. Be sensible. And so now, when Paul is talking about the grace of God, and how the grace of God teaches us, and how the grace of God instructs us and schools us, he's saying that in this class on the, the, that focuses on the present life, we're taught, we're trained to live sensibly. And, we're, and that's responsibility toward ourselves. We're to be sensible. But we're also trained to be righteous, to live righteously, to be upright in our dealings with each other. Not to be crooked, not to be curved, but to be upright. And he says also God's grace teaches us to live godly in this present life. You are in a class, I'm in a class, where God's grace is continually teaching us with regards to the present life, continually instructing us on how we are to live. And how are we to live? We are to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So there's a class on the past life, there's a class on the present life, but the last class I want us to see is the class that deals with the future. And this is probably the class that we need the most. This is a class that so often in our walk with God, we seem not to learn the lessons of this class. In verses 13 and 14, Paul deals with the future. And he tells us that God's grace instructs us to live, but to live anticipating and expecting what's going to happen in the future. Sometimes we are so wrapped up on the present so concerned with what's going on in our life right now that we never look up. We never think about the future. And particularly, we don't think about the future in the way that Paul writes about here. But Paul is saying that God's grace is at work in us. And God's grace is trying to teach us and instruct us and school us to anticipate and to long for the future. And so Paul writes 
first of all, about the event that's at the center of the future life. And then he's going to write about the person who's at the center of the future life. If you look at verse 13, he says that we are to live looking for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Looking, anticipating, longing for, expecting the future. That's the attitude that Paul is talking about. That, that God's grace will be at work in us. God will use different means and different ways in our life to cause us to be looking for something. And the thing that we are to be looking for, Paul describes as the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. I take it that he's referring to one event, but he wants us to look at that event from two angles. He wants us to look at that event as the blessed hope, the grace of God, God's graciousness that appeared in Jesus Christ. It teaches us to look, to anticipate, to long for, to expect the blessed hope. The hope the realization that all that God has promised us in the future. And he's saying that we look for that which God has promised us. It's kind of like what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, that we are to set our hope on the grace which is being brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When you think about these future things that God has promised us, you can say that's grace because we don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. But yet we are to set our hope on that. And here Paul is just simply saying uh, not what we are to do, but he's saying that what is ours in the future, what is ours in the future can be described as our hope. But it's a blessed hope. And the reason why it's a blessed hope it's because when we realize that hope, when, when it becomes a reality, it is going to bring marvelous and tremendous blessings to the individual believer. Oh, if we could just grasp and understand all, all that will be ours when Jesus Christ comes again, we would see that it's not just a hope, it is a blessed hope. It is a hope that transforms us. It is a hope that causes us to be, eventually that day, to be totally blessed. Looking for the blessed hope. But also, Paul says, looking for the appearing. The appearing. He's just said God's grace has appeared. Now he says in verse 13, the appearing. Those two words are part of the same family. And again, it speaks of something that's going to burst on the scene. And he's saying that we're looking for the appearing. The appearing of what? He says the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, if I was writing this, I probably would have said, we're looking for the appearing of Christ Jesus. But Paul didn't write that. Maybe we could have thrown in some extra word. Maybe I would have wrote the appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. And don't miss those words. I'll let your Greek professors deal with that uh, phrase and how it's constructed, but I take it that what Paul is teaching here is that Christ Jesus, Messiah Jesus, is our great God. And Messiah Jesus is our great Savior. 
But Paul didn't say that we're looking for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. He says we're looking for the glory. We're looking for the appearing of the glory of our great God and our Savior, Christ Jesus. He's letting us know that this event will be the unveiling, so to speak, of the glory that is associated with our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know what your theological perspective is on the future. And I'm not even going to dive into that pool. But all I can say is that Paul, eschatology was alive. He was expecting that this event would happen in his lifetime. And if you don't think so, I just say read First and Second Thessalonians. But Paul says, Titus, we're looking. God's grace teaches us with regards to the future. And it teaches us to look for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. That's the event that we're to be looking for. But associated with that event is a wonderful person. Paul has already referred to him as Christ Jesus. He's already referred to him as our great God, our great Savior. But look at verse 14, and that's where I want to end. Because I think the reason why some of us don't look for this event is because we really hadn't, hadn't come to grips with verse 14. Pause in verse 14. Who gave himself for us? Who gave himself for us? My friends, those are wonderful words. Those are words where we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Who, that is Christ Jesus, the one who's our great God, the one who's our great Savior, gave himself. And, and Paul can't look at that event when he thinks about the, the work of Christ on the cross, the sacrificial death of the cross on the cross. He can't look at that event and say, well, it doesn't have any ramifications for me. He said, who gave himself, Titus, for us. Titus, he gave himself. The, the, our great God, our, our great Savior, Messiah, Jesus, gave himself for us. And later on, he's going to say in chapter 3, verse uh, 5, God saved us. So Paul understands this magnificent salvation that is ours. And at the root of that salvation is the work of Christ. Christ gave himself for us. For what purpose? That he might redeem us. And not only redeem us, but that he might purify for himself a people, for his own possession, who will be involved in good deeds. That's why we're here, my friend, to do good deeds. But we need to meditate on this reality, this truth, that he gave himself for us. Because when we meditate on that truth, that reality, when we fully comprehend it and understand it, then we'll be looking for the blessed hope. We'll be looking for the one who gave himself for us. We'll be anticipating the future event that is wrapped up in a person who gave himself for us to redeem us and to purify for himself a people. When I grew up uh, in my father-in-law's church, there was a song that they used to sing. And somehow, some way, that song didn't mean anything to me. I heard it many times, but now that I've gotten older, now that I understand a little bit more about my Bible, I understand that they were talking about the blessed hope. They were talking about the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. And the choir used to sing, Oh, I want to see him. 
look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all pass, home at last, ever to rejoice. He gave himself for us. And if you fully understand that, then God's grace will teach you that you want to see him. All of us are in the school of grace. And the question is, what kind of students are we? Is it evident that the grace of God has taught us and is teaching us concerning our past life, our present life, and our future life? Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.